already shared with the kids, and as you hear, we're going to be looking today at one of Jesus' parables, and as I mentioned, actually, the first parable that Matthew uh, reports Jesus to have shared with uh, those who are listening. Uh, and, and, and you can imagine that then this is Matthew's introduction of this methodology that Jesus would use over and over again of sharing simple, common stories about the everyday lives of people in order to teach them about the nature of the kingdom of God. Uh, and, and the parable of the sower, of course, is a good example of that. Now, before we go any further, I, I, I want to stop right here and, and I want to lay out a principle that I know for me has been very helpful as I read the parables of Jesus. And that principle is that if I interpret the parable in such a way that there is nothing surprising or even shocking about it, I need to go back and read the parable again. The parables of Jesus are intended to, to get us to think about things in a different way. And, and so they always introduce something that, that uh, goes against our expectations, something that surprises us, something that invites us to sort of see that the world actually is what is tipsy-turvy, upside down, and we need to get right in our way of thinking. And so when we listen to a parable, we have to understand that the upsetting of expectations is what the parables are all about. And, and so we always want to ask, what is it about this parable that might have upset the expectations of Jesus' hearers in his day? And, and what does it do to upset our expectations here and now? That's what we need to pay attention to. Now, now sometimes the, the, the surprise or the shock of a parable is easier to feel than others. But today's lesson contains one of those parables where right away we, we have sort of a, a, an upsetting of expectation. We, we read or we hear about a, a sower that is not in the least bit careful about how he sows seeds. Now, I'm not a gardener, but I would imagine that when I get a packet of seeds or when I get seeds that I have grown and developed uh, through my care, I don't waste those seeds, right? I, I put them in carefully cultivated ground. I I'm not a gardener, but I, I, I learned that from my father, and, and he was a gardener. He loved to have wonderful and beautiful flowers and vegetables, and he loved to have a, a, a thick and lush lawn in front of his house, and me, I'm the kind of fellow that, that, you know, I don't pay that much attention. Sometimes my neighbors wish I did pay more, <laughs> a little more attention, but my, my father was one of those, you know, who had, always had the nicest lawn in the garden, and, and when he would come home from work every day in the spring or summer, I always remember he would he would almost the first thing he would do was to, to take off his work clothes and, and put on his gardening clothes and go out in the garden and, and take care of his flowers and his roses and, and his lawn. And, 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 and I remember how if there was a bare patch on the lawn, he would take care of that right away. He would get there with his little... Uh, a uh, little digger, and he would he would break up the, the, the land, the ground, and, and then he would carefully create furrows, and, and then he would put, sprinkle his seeds in those furrows, and then, then he might even put some straw over them to, to keep the moisture in, and then he would, every day he would spray them, and he'd make sure he didn't spray it so hard that he would blow the seeds away, and he was careful about this. He, he took his time. And, 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 and he wanted to make sure that if he was going to sow the seed, that he sowed them in a place where it was likely that there would be good outcome. And, and so having learned that, I, I read this parable, and what upsets my expectations is that what kind of sower is this who just goes out there, doesn't do anything to prepare the land, just takes handfuls of seed, throws them here and throws them there, and sometimes 
sometimes it lands in the rocky ground and nothing ever happens to it. And sometimes it gets thrown into the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the thorns and the thorns just can't allow something like that to grow. What kind of gardener, what kind of sower is this? Yeah. So when we have this upsetting of expectations of the parable, we want to we want to pay attention. We want to ask ourselves, what is going on here that this sower is so reckless? And as we do, we remember that this is a parable, and it's meant to teach us something about God's ways and and, and the kingdom of God and and the way that we need to reorient our lives. So we ask ourselves again, what sort of sower is this? And what does this teach us about who God is and who we are? Now later on in Matthew 13, if you read the rest of the chapter, you will see that this is one of the very few parables that Jesus takes some time to explain. And I invite you to, to read that. We're not going to get there today, but I invite you to read it. Jesus explains this parable in detail. And one of the things that he says, if we read further, one of the things he says about this parable is that the, the seed that is being sown, it represents people hearing the good news of the kingdom of God. The seed is the word. And sometimes that word takes root in a person's life, and sometimes it doesn't. But the seed is the word. And then the sower then becomes anyone who spreads the word. Anyone who spreads that seed, God included. God's the ultimate sower, but then there are lots of other sowers. And they're sowing God's seed into the world. And every time and in any way that the good news or the gospel of the kingdom of God is shared with someone or with a group of people, it's like seeds being sown. And like I said, sometimes the word of God falls on receptive ear, ears, and sometimes it falls on deaf ears. But the point is that God is sowing seeds, either himself directly or through us, and that God doesn't take any sort of care about where the seed falls. There's no real uh, specific strategy. God isn't concerned about efficiency or, or return on investment. He's going to throw that seed out here and there, wherever, and let it do whatever it will do. And so the point is that God is not in any way skimpy about sowing the seed of the good news of the kingdom. He's not withholding it from anybody. Like the sower in the parable, God tosses the seed of the good news indiscriminately, extravagantly into the hearts of every human being, no matter what their seeming capacity for being able to receive that seed will be. God doesn't care. God's a reckless sower. He's not a worried about efficiency, and he doesn't give up. Just keep sowing the seed. Come what may. Now, part of the explanation for God's reckless sowing is that unlike a seed that a farmer uses or a gardener, there is no such thing as scarcity when it comes to the seed that God sows. If you think of it this way, God's got an endless bag of seed. <laughs> There's no shortage. And so you don't have to worry about whether you're throwing too much out or where it's going. You just do it. And that's what God is doing in our lives and asking us to do in the lives of others. God's seed bag is never empty. There's no need to skip or save, no need to preserve, no need to hoard, no need to really plan too much. The Word of God is the ultimate renewable resource that never runs dry. I think that that's because that God's, the, the heart of God's word is love. And as the apostle reminds us 
Apostle Paul, love never fails. And as the Apostle John tells us, God is love, right? You can't have God without love. You can't have love without God. Amen? Amen. And so if the Word of God is based on love, well, then that seed of the Word of God never fails, right? That's what Paul tells us. The love never fails. Love never ends. Now, real agape love, not those other kinds of love, right? Because we know other kinds of love, and it fails all the time, you know? Your heart starts beating because you see a man or a woman that you like, and, and for a while that's cool, but eventually the heart stops being quite so hard, right? Amen? Amen? <laughs> but the love of God, agape love, divine love, never fails. It never ends. And just at the point when our resources are beginning to fail or give up, God's resources are just beginning to kick in. That's especially true about love. I, I think I learned a little bit about this kind of love by becoming a parent. Some of y'all know what I mean, right? I can remember when my daughter Emily was born. Some of y'all met Emily last week. She was here for our first Sunday. And I can remember when my daughter Emily was born and, and that first time that I saw her little face coming out of her mother's womb, I was, I was bowled over by a more powerful feeling of love than I had ever felt before. I wasn't expecting it. I knew I was going to love my daughter, but I wasn't expecting to, I didn't expect how deep and how powerful that love would be and how instantaneous it just swept into my life. And, and again, I know that some of you all know about what I'm talking about when you see that child for the first time. And, and, and when I experienced that, you know, it, 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 it was interesting because, you know, babies, when they're first born, don't necessarily, they don't necessarily look their best, right? I mean, my little daughter, as beautiful as she became, she, she, when she was first born, I mean, she was all red and wrinkly and gooey. And, 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 and one of the things I had been told to expect was she, she had a pointy head. Did any of your kids have a pointy head when they came out? She had been in that birth canal for a long time and was getting squeezed and their heads are soft still at that point. And so she came out with a, a pointy head. I, I asked my wife, did, did we give birth to a cone head? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and, then, and then that head kind of got brown and you know, lovely and all of that. But, but, but like I said, right then she didn't look at it. And, and so it wasn't because she looked cute or beautiful that made me love her. It was God. Because God makes it that way. Thank God. Amen. That God provides us with this capacity to love our children that just shows up. Now, now so, so my daughter was born. I had that powerful experience. That, that powerful spirit experience stayed with me and I continued to be able to love my daughter and she grew up and, and even when she came, became a little less cute and all of that sort of thing, I just kept loving her. And, and I thought that it would just never be possible for me to love anyone more than my daughter. Even, even. I love my wife. I, I, I know I'm on dangerous ground here. <laughs> but I think there is something special about the love for, between a parent and a child. Do, do, do you see what I'm saying? That reflects the relationship between God and us. You know? Anyway. I didn't think it was possible. And then we found out that we were going to have another child. And, and, and a little while later, you know, my son was going to be born. And, and I was worried. You know, I was worried because I said, you know, how can I find more room in my heart? My heart is so full with love for my daughter. How am I going to find more room for, I don't think I can do that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Ever had any concern about that? Yeah. No? 
Especially some of y'all, if you've had like six or seven children, like, how much more room in my heart can I? Yeah, I, but I, I was, I was already stuck on only a second child. How was I going to find that? And, and then Danny was born, and it, and and whoop, God cleared out some more space in my heart, and, and I loved him just as much. Love is of God, and God is love, and that love is the ultimate renewable resource. You see, I was thinking that, that love was sort of like a commodity. You know, it, it was like food or, or water or energy, and that somehow, sometime, it would come to an end. There would be just enough, and I'd give enough of it, and then suddenly there would be no more. It would be like opening the cupboard, and, and there was nothing in the cupboard. You understand what I'm saying? But that's not the way God's love works. When it comes to God's love, there's, there's no such thing ever as an empty cupboard. There's no, no end in sight. There's no incapacity of God to, to not give more love and give people the capacity to give more love. You see, the way that God loves us is that God has so much love, He doesn't know what to do with it. That sometimes someone would say, you know, that God loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. Right? That's because God has so much love, he doesn't know what to do. He's just throwing it all over the place. Recklessly. See, that's the kind of love that God has for you and me. Strong and deep and steady and never ending and never failing. And that means that we're also called to live out that kind of love. The kind of love that God shares with us, we are called to share with other people just as indiscriminately as God does. You and I get to be like the sower in the parable too, if we open ourselves up to it. You and I get to dip into that endless seed bag of God's love and, and share the good news through loving words and actions recklessly and indiscriminately, not worrying about whether the seed will ever take root, not feeling the need to try to figure out whether someone will be receptive or not. Do you ever do that? You see somebody and you say, oh, they'll never. They're so far from God. I don't even need to. Why would I bother talking to them? Those are the exact persons that God wants us to reach out to. Amen? Amen. Because you never know, at least we know. I don't, I don't pretend to be able to see in your heart or your mind. Only God can do that. Yeah. I'm going to let God to decide, you know? They always say, you know, be a fisher of men. You catch them, God will clean them. Amen? <laughs> you don't worry. You see, we never know because you never know when some kind of word or some word of, of challenge or grace will make a difference in somebody's life that you never expected. You, you never know what stray seed will lie dormant for years and then, and then suddenly out of nowhere it'll spring to life. You never know when someone's heart that seems so hardened and so far from God will get softened up by something that happens to them and when you say something to them or give them a word or, or, or be kind to them, you might be spreading the seed yeah, yes. just at the time when it will take root. You see, you never know, so you just got to keep sowing just like the sower did. You just know that, that God's got more than enough seed and that he just needs somebody to help to sow it. There's a story told by a, a wonderful preacher being Fred Craddock about the time he got a phone call from a woman whose father had died. She, she had been a teenager in one of the churches he had served as pastor 20 years before that. And he remembered her, he, he, and he said he would have sworn that if there was ever a person who never heard a word he said, that teenage girl was it. She was one of those types sitting up in the balcony, some of you know what I'm talking about, you know, they'd sit in the back of the lane with the other, for their other friends and they'd be giggling and Drawing on the, the uh, you know, the, the pulp bulletin and, and passing notes to boys. And she, she, that was what she was doing all the time. He thought just, you know, she's there just wasting her time. She's never heard anything that I said. But when her father died, she, she looked up her old preacher 
the Reverend Fred Craddock, and she gave him a call. She says, I, I don't know if you remember me. She started, oh, yes, uh, yeah, he remembered me. She said, when my daddy died, I, I thought I was going to come apart. And, and I cried and cried and cried. I, I didn't know what to do. But then I remembered something you said in one of your sermons. And Fred Craddock was stunned. She had remembered something that he had said in one of the sermons while she was passing notes. <coughs> giggling. It was proof enough to him that you can never tell how the seed will fall or where or when it might take root. So friends, I, I, as we close, I want to ask you to imagine in your mind's eye two things. I want you to imagine God sowing the seeds of his love and his word into your heart over and over and over again. Some of the seeds maybe have already taken root, but maybe for some of us they've never really gotten started to grow, or they started to grow but then kind of withered out. But either way, just imagine that seed being poured into your life in good times and in bad, when you're ready for it, when you're not ready. Just being poured over and over again. And then, then I want you to imagine yourself as one of God's farm hands, set out to sow his seed in the world. Imagine yourself walking down the road just flinging that seed over and over again. Loving the unlovable, reaching out to the least and the lost, sharing a smile or a word of love and good news with a struggling neighbor or, or a patient or, or a co-worker. And all of it, the seed of God's love is being sown over and over again. Because God has more seed and more love than he knows what to do. And because of that, God loves you and God loves the world so much. Mm. There's nothing you can do about it. Amen. Amen. Amen.